My wife just told me that she's heard me called a lot of things over the years, but never Pastor Jeff. <laughs> I don't know what she meant by that. <laughs> um, I, Ernie mentioned that the pastor and his family are in Maine, and I got a text yesterday afternoon um, that <clears throat> they you know, had spent their time in Maine, and the plan was to go to New Hampshire for a couple days, and on the interstate, one of their tires blew out on their car. Um, everybody was safe, but of course they had to put their spare on, and you know they were, they were worried about getting to New Hampshire and then getting home without a spare tire. So, so pray for them uh, this week as they, you know, as they spend a couple days in New Hampshire, and they'll be headed home. Um, and just pray that you know that they don't have any more incidents with that, and um, that they get home safely. When Pastor Scott asked me to speak today, he um, gave me a choice. I could either do Revelations 5, chapter 5, which is where he is, or I could choose something on my own. And I remember Matt McDermott, how he stepped up courageously and did a very difficult sermon um, that corresponded with where the pastor was in Revelations. And so I was going to do the same thing. And I read Revelations 5, and um, I poked around on the internet for some commentaries and looking for some opinions and si some things that I could talk about, and I ended up chickening out. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave that one for the professional. <laughs> so there's no title for my, um, for my sermon in the bulletin today, um, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but first, I'd like to read a portion, a, a portion of Scripture that's the inspiration um, for my talk today. Okay, the reading comes from James chapter 2, and I'm going to start with verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person, justif you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Now, if you were reading along with me, you know that that last verse there was a little out of place. Um, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. That's actually from later in James. Um, so if you were reading along, that verse was kind of out of place uh, where it is. It doesn't seem to apply to the rest of that chapter. So I took it and I moved it here because it seemed to belong better there. So did anyone wonder why I walked down from the pulpit to read the scripture? Did anybody think that I just forgot my Bible back there? <laughs> yeah. I know that's what my wife would have thought if I hadn't told her that that's what I was going to do, um, because that's pretty typical of me. Um, 
The purpose of my reading from the middle of the church um, was only to make you wonder what in the world I was up to. <laughs> so the title of my sermon is Live a Questionable Life. Okay, there's an author and blogger named Jordan Jones, and she says, we should live a life that makes people think, <clears throat> we should live a life that makes people think, that makes them question their own lives and purpose, that makes them reevaluate priorities and shift their mindset. I want you to think for a moment about what the general population thinks about Christianity. In one survey, the most often mentioned traits of the Christian church were judgmental, hypocritical, intolerant, and pious. I don't agree with that perception, but we have to acknowledge it. And we also have to acknowledge that there might be reasons for it. But let me tell you some things about the church and Christianity that I know to be true. In 1976, a Christian couple named Millard and Linda Fuller became unfulfilled with their lifestyle. They developed the, con the concept of partnership housing. The concept centered on those in need of adequate shelter working side by side with volunteers to build decent, affordable houses. The houses would be built at no profit. New homeowners' house payments would be combined with no interest loans provided by supporters and money earned by fundraising to create the Fund for Humanity, which would then be used to build more homes. Bo and Emma were the owners of the first home built by Koinonia's Partnership Housing Program. They and their five children moved into a concrete block home with a modern kitchen, indoor bathroom, and heating system, replacing the unpainted, uninsulated shack with no plumbing where they had previously lived. In 1973, the Fullers decided to take the Fund for Humanity concept to Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. After three years of hard work to launch a successful house building program there, the Fullers then returned to the United States and called together a group of supporters to discuss the future of their dream. Habitat for Humanity International was founded in 1976. The times have changed, the build site locations have grown in number, but the very real change that Bo and Emma's family experienced is shared by families today who partner with Habitat to build or improve a place that they call home. Thanks in no small part to the, to the personal involvement of US President Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind, and the awareness they have raised, Habitat now works in all 50 states in the US and in more than 70 countries and has helped more than 22 million people achieve strength, stability, and independence through safe, decent, and affordable shelter. There's a story that says that as the couple was presenting this idea to a group of potential donors, the potential, one of the potential donors asked them, who's gonna pay the contractors and the people to build these houses? And the Fuller said, we're counting on people from the church, from churches all over the country to volunteer to do that. No one believed that would happen, but that's exactly what happened. That's the impression of the church that I have. In the year 2000, a Christian gentleman named Scott Harris decided that the fact that over 900 million people live without clean, drinkable water was unacceptable. He decided to do something about it. With support from the Christian church, he founded Water for Life. Since 2000, since the year 2000, this organization has dug more than 6,000
6,200 water wells in third world countries with a goal of creating more than 400 wells in just the next year. They have provided millions of people with clean, drinkable water and saved thousands of lives. This is my perception of the church. There's a lady in this congregation, she's a member right here at Cedar Heights. She thinks that no child in our community should go without decent clothes or coats or shoes. And so every year she spends countless hours preparing for the baby goods exchange. This is my perception of the church. There's a gentleman in this congregation that a few years ago was going to purchase a truck. He decided that there must be someone out there who needed a truck more than he needed the money to offset the cost of, of his truck. And so he went searching for a stranger that needed a vehicle. And when he found him, he gave away his truck rather than use that as a trade-in on his truck. That's my perception of the church. I could go on and on. Um, Operation Christmas Child, VBS. The Christian church takes a bad rap. Historically, most of the first hospitals and first universities were founded by the Christian church. Every year, hundreds of doctors who could earn six-figure salaries if they stayed here in the United States, they choose to move overseas to provide medical care to people who have none and desperately need it. Likewise, Christian teachers who could have relatively comfortable, safe jobs in the suburbs choose to go to the inner city to teach where no one else wants to teach. This is my perception of Christianity. And yet, that other perception still exists. And it'll continue to exist until every one of us does the work to change it. James says it, James says it best. What good is faith if it has no deeds? We need to commit to live lives that are questionable. Lives that will make people turn their heads and think, why did she do that? We need to commit to lead lives that live out the gospel of Christ, that make people wonder, that make people ask questions. Live questionable lives. Jesus, James, and the other New Testament writers saw a powerful integration of faith and action, so much so that they found it impossible to separate them. I'd like to read an, ex an excerpt from a book that illustrates this impact. And this is from a book that was written in 1986, so it, it's a pretty old book. Um, it's called All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It was written by Robert Fulgham. There is a person who has profoundly disturbed my peace of mind for a long time. She doesn't even know me, but she continually goes around minding my business. We have very little in common. She is an old woman, an Albanian, who grew up in Yugoslavia. She is a Roman Catholic nun who lives in poverty in India. She stands at the center of great contradictory notions and strong forces that shape human destiny. She drives me crazy. I get upset every time I hear her name or read her words or see her face. I don't even want to talk about her. In the studio where I work, there is a wash basin. Above the wash basin is a mirror. I stop at this place several times each day to tidy up and look at myself in the mirror. 
Alongside the mirror is a photograph of the troublesome, troublesome woman. Each time I look in the mirror at myself, I also look at her face. In it, I have seen more than I can tell, and from what I see, I understand more than I can say. The photograph was taken in Oslo, Norway on the 10th of December in 1980. This is what happened there. A small stooped woman in a faded blue sari and worn sandals received an award from the hand of a king, an award funded from the will of the inventor of dynamite. In a great glittering hall of velvet and gold and crystal, surrounded by the noble and famous in formal black and in elegant gowns, the rich, the powerful, the brilliant, the talented of the world in attendance. And there at the center of it all, a little old lady in sari and sandals, Mother Teresa of India, servant of the poor and sick and dying. To her, the Nobel Peace Prize. No Shah or president or king or general, or scientist, or pope, no banker, or merchant, or, court, or cartel, or oil company, or ayatollah holds the key to as much power as she has. None is as rich, for hers is the invinci invincible weapon against the evils of this earth, the caring heart. And hers are the everlasting riches of this life, the wealth of the compassionate spirit. To cut through the, the smog of helpless cynicism, to take only the tool of un uncompromising love, to make manifest the capacity for healing humanity's wounds, to make the st story of the Good Samaritan a living reality, and to live so true a life as to shine out from the back streets of Calcutta, takes courage and faith we cannot admit in ourselves and cannot be without. I do not speak her language, yet the eloquence of her life speaks to me, and I am chastised and blessed at the same time. I do not, one, I do not believe one person can do much in this world, yet there she stood in Oslo, affecting the world around. The power of her faith shames me and I believe in Mother Teresa. December in Oslo, the message for the world at Christmas tide is one of peace, not the peace of a child asleep in the manger of long ago, nor the peace of a full dinner and a nap by the fire on December 25th, but a tough, vibrant, vital peace that comes from the, extra the extraordinary gesture one simple woman in a faded sari and worn sandals makes this night. A peace of mind that comes from a piece of work. Some years later at a grand conference of quantum physicists and religious mystics at the Oberoi Towers Hotel in Bombay, I saw that face again. Standing by the door at the rear of the hall, I sensed a presence beside me. And there she was, alone, come to speak to the conference as its guest. She looked at me and smiled. I see her face still. She strode to the rostrum and changed the agenda, from, and changed the agenda of the conference from intellectual inquiry to moral activism. She said in a firm voice to the awed assembly, we can do no great things only small things with great love. The contradictions of her life and faith are nothing compared to my own. And while I wrestle with frustration about the impotence of the individual, she goes right on changing the world. While I wish for more power and resources, she uses her power and resources to do what she can at the moment. She upsets me disturbs me, shames me. What does she have that I do not? If ever there is truly peace on earth, goodwill to men, it will be because of women like Mother Teresa. Peace is not something you wish for. It's something you make, something you do, something you are, and something 
you give away. I thought that was pretty powerful. Now, I'm not here today to say that we can all be Mother Teresa's, or even that we should be. But we are called to live out our faith in a way that will make people question us. Living a questionable life means making people turn their heads and wonder. If you're at all like me, then you probably think that you're not doing nearly enough. That's why I like Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. That says, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I once heard someone say, and I don't know who it was, um, but they said something to the effect that if you think that you're not going to that you're not going to reach God's calling in your life, then you have no idea of the power of God. So if we do want to take up the challenge of living a questionable life, how do we do it? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> a month or two, Pastor Scott gave me a book and asked me to read it. Um, it's, it's this little book. doesn't look like much. Um, and I don't read, I listen. Um, I drive a lot, so rather than read, um, I have the Audible app, and so I listen to books while I'm driving. And it just so happened that the next day, um, I was driving to Johnstown to take some medicine to my mom, and that's about a two-hour drive, so I decided to listen to the book. And what I did is I listened to the book on the way there. Yep, I listened to the whole book on the way to Johnstown. I'm a very fast listener. <laughs> and I, I was intrigued by the book, and so I listened to it again on my way home. Now, I listen to a lot of books on Audible when I'm driving, and I listen to a lot of self-help books. Um, I guess I'm kind of a sucker for self-help books. Um, you know, I've done books on how to be a better leader, you know, one-minute manager, how to be a better spouse, uh, how to be more organized. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you what a waste of time and money that was. <laughs> you see, she's the world's most organized person, and I'm one of the world's least organized people. So we complement each other. Anyways, my point is that the book is amazingly straightforward and that it would be beneficial, and I thought it would be beneficial to try to apply the principles to my life. And so I kind of made a commitment to myself to do that. And then the next day, Pastor Scott told me that he had given the book to five other people and would like to meet each week to talk about how we were doing. Uh-oh. <laughs> now it's getting real, and I'm going to have to be accountable to someone to try to um, bring these principles into my life. So that was kind of scary. Now, the name of the book is Surprise the World. And not surprisingly, it's about leading a questionable life to advance the gospel of Christ. The subtitle of the book is the Five Habits of Highly Missional People. The author gives five very simple but practical steps to stand out and make, make people ask why you behave as you do. The author asks us to develop these five habits. 
and, and I want to go over them, and I'm not going to go in detail because I want you to get the book and read it. And he uses um, the acronym BELLS, B-E-L-L-S, to spell out the five steps so that you can't forget them. The first principle, or the first step, is to bless three people each week. One person from your church, one person not from your church, and one person from either group. Now you might ask, what does it mean to bless somebody? It can be anything. It can be taking a coworker a cup of coffee in the morning. It could be mowing your neighbor's grass. It could be sending a text message to someone in the church that you know is going through a rough time. It can be anything, but you do three a week. So that's B for bless of, of the five letter of bells. The second letter is E, and that stands for eat. Now you like that, don't you? <laughs> he asks us to eat with three people each week, one person from your church, one person not from your church, and one from either group. Now you might wonder, what good does that do? Well, Christ was all about hospitality, and he says that eating with someone helps us to build relationships. Now, you know, sometimes these things are really difficult to do, and it's time for the group to meet, and you've only done one or two, um, and you kind of feel a little bit of pressure because you're going to have to be accountable to these people. Um, but sometimes things just fall in your lap. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Sandy and I had been at work all day, and we were kind of looking for a place to go eat um, because it, it was getting late, and we hadn't, neither one of us had even eaten lunch. Um, so we get a text message from Corey that says, hey, want to meet us at the Broken Axe? And we're like, yeah, we can do that because we love to eat with Dan and Corey, so please, please don't feel used. But I looked at Sandy and I said, I can count that as eating with someone at church. <laughs> so sometimes there's pressure and sometimes, you know, they just fall, kind of fall in your lap. The first L in bells is for listen. And this principle says, I will listen, I will spend at least one period of time each week listening for the Spirit's voice. The author suggests at least 20 minutes alone, no phone, no music, no devotional book, just quiet, specifically listening for the voice of the Spirit. The second L in bells is learn. Spend one period of time each week learning about Christ. Read the Gospels, read the New Testament, read commentaries, watch movies about the life of Christ. He says anything that will make you learn more about Jesus Christ. And then the S in bells is for scent. And this principle is, I will journal throughout the week about all the ways I alerted others to the, universe, to the universal reign of God through Christ. So you'll journal about your efforts to do the other steps, to, to bless people, to eat, to listen, and to learn. <clears throat> I want to read just what the author says about these steps. He says, if you bless three people every week, you're going to become a very generous person. If you eat with others, you'll develop a greater capacity for hospitality. If you foster the habit of listening to the Holy Spirit, you'll become an increasingly Spirit-led person. If you're learning Christ, it's fair to assume you'll become more and more Christ-like. If you're journaling the myriad ways you've been sent into the world, you'll increasingly see yourself as a sent one or a missionary in your own neighborhood. Now, you may wonder how all this applies to you. And the thing is, is the pastor is interested in expanding this group. So he wants to give more people the book, and he wants to get more people meeting together um, and working on these principles. I want to ask you to consider it. 
I want you to read the book of James and then read it again. And I'd like to take the last little bit of time that I have and tell you a little bit about how it's going with the group. Um, this past week we met, and we met at Rey Azteca because, you know, food. <laughs> and of course, um, the pastor and Lori weren't there. Pastor Scott and Lori weren't there because they're in Maine, and that's the first time that we met without them. So that, that was certainly a little bit different. But we talked about um, how it's going, and we talked about some of the struggles that we're having, um, and there was probably more talk about the struggles than there were um, about how things were really going. Um, but, it, but it was really interesting, and it was really good. Um, and what we all admitted to each other was that none of us had really um, done a lot with the with the S part of it, um, and that nobody was really journaling every day like we were supposed to. Um, and and that, was, uh, that was universal, you know, among all of us in the group. And I don't, I don't know if Scott and Laurie are doing it or not, because they weren't there, but we were all struggling with that. So we talked about that a little bit, um, and we talked about some of the things that we've done. Um, and a couple weeks ago, um, I shared something that happened to me that, that I feel was only because of this book, because I don't think I would have done this had it not been for the book. And, when, and I'll share that story with you, but when, see, I missed the first meeting. I was out of town or something, the first meeting. Um, Matt hasn't let me forget it. Um, but I missed the first meeting, so I didn't know that somebody won every week. Okay, so we all shared our stories about how we bless people. Um, and Jason looked at me and said, Jeff, you win the week. And I didn't even know I could win the week. <laughs> but anyways, what, what happened to me was, is um, a couple of years ago, um, the state of Pennsylvania decided that, see, you, you, before this declaration or whatever it was, you needed a prescription to get syringes, like you would use to inject something. Um, you needed a prescription to get that. But the state of Pennsylvania sent out a letter encouraging pharmacies um, to just sell syringes if people came in um, in order to try to curb the epidemic of bloodborne diseases um, from addiction. So, you know, we were asked to please sell syringes to people that come in in order to try to curb um, hepatitis C and the spread of AIDS and you know, other, blood, other terrible blood-borne diseases. Um, and so we do that. And we've been doing that for a couple years, but a gentleman come in that week to the pharmacy and um, he was buying syringes. And most of those people try not to be seen. Like when they come in, they won't talk to you. They'll keep their head down. But this guy will come in and he'll talk about, he loves to fish. He'll talk about fishing with me. Um, and, you know, so we just talk for a little bit, and then, you know, unfortunately, he buys syringes. And this day, he just looked, he looked bad. He looked sick. And so when he left, I, I stood there, and I thought about the book. And that's the good thing about the book, because the book makes you think every day about what you should do. And I thought about the book, and I decided that I was going to do something. So I took off after him. Now, I didn't run down the street after him, but I walked faster. I walked faster than him for about four or five blocks, and I finally caught up to him. And I didn't know if he was going to blow me off or get mad at me and yell at me or just keep walking. But he stopped, and he, and he talked to me, and I asked him, please not to use those syringes. I said, you, don't, you look sick. I said, I'm worried that something bad's going to happen to you. And he said, they're not for what you think. He says, I have a dog with diabetes. And I looked at him, and let me tell you something. Before this book, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have challenged him. But I looked at him, and I said, I don't believe that you have a dog with diabetes. I said, please don't use the syringes. I says, get help. I said, I'll help you get help. Um, but he stuck with his story that, um, that he had a dog with diabetes. But then he told me that, he says, besides, I'm on probation, he says, and, if, and I get drug tested every day, so I can't even do that. He says, or they'd find it. 
And I said, look, I said, I don't know what you have that they can't pick up in the drug test. I says, but it's hurting you. I said, I can see that you're sick. And I tried to get him just to go with me to get something to drink or something, um, but he wouldn't do that. But he did stand and talk to me for like five minutes. Um, and I told him that I didn't want to see something happen to him. And that was it. Then he laughed. And I don't know whether that did any good at all. Um, you know, it, it, most likely it didn't. But at least he knew that somebody cared about him. Um, and I think that that's the point of the book. And so if you read the book and you try to apply the principles, you, you start to think about it more and more every day. And what, a, what um, I did is I asked a couple of the other people in the group if they would share what it's meant for them. Um, so I'm going to ask Brett if he would take um, the handheld mic to Laura. Would you go first? Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff. <laughs> so I am a happy member of the group. Um, it has been wonderful to meet with the, the other members every week. Um, at first, I'll be honest that the thought of one more weekly thing kind of made me tired. And it, it kind of made me go, do we really have to do this? To which Matt, my wonderful husband, responded, yes, we do, because the pastor asked us to. So we did. Um, and it, it really does become part of your regular thinking. Um, I got through the book pretty quickly, and it, was, it really just sort of invades your, your everyday thoughts. Um, I will say that this group has also been really good because I've, for many of you know, I've been really struggling lately. Um, personally, with everything going on with my family, as well as spiritually because of that. And I've sort of been in a dark place and it's been very hard to focus on some of the things. Um, and this group has been there and has been the sounding board, and I've been able to be real with them and say, this is what I need, pray for me, but talk me through this because I'm really frustrated. And so having this group to go to has been a blessing to me more than I feel like I've blessed anyone else. Thanks, Laura. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, I don't know where to stand. I don't know what to do with my hands. Uh, <laughs> I'll stand right here, I guess. That's okay. Um, I'm Megan. For those of you who don't know me, my other aliases are Rhonda's daughter or Libby's mom. Uh, so I was also invited to be a, com be a part of the group of what we call the DNA. Um, I struggle with that acronym. I think it's discipleship. Um, nurturing and accountability, that's what we like to call our secret small group. It's not really a secret. I like to give the Nana a hard time because she's, al she's always giving me, you know, hey, are you going to your secret meeting? Are you going to your secret meeting? So <laughs> um, I've had to cancel dinners with her and things like that just because of needing to go to our meeting. And it's not just, I think, like Laura said, it's not the need. Um, Maybe there is on the spiritual level of wanting to do this group as a need for me because it fills me spiritually. It's like that halfway point through the week where you have church Sunday on Sunday, but on Wednesdays or Thursdays or whatever day that we get together for this time of fellowship and just share where we are with our walk, whether you know the blessings or where we've been successful in eating or you know just sharing our personal experiences uh, is really uplifting and then talking about the struggles you know what I mean is you know nobody's there to say well you failed you lost this week so <laughs> uh, it's not anything like that but it's just you know the encouraging and build on building off of each other's um, ways that I've 
so you can't have a bad attitude going into this. Uh, and I think that's one of the blessings that we receive. You're never, when you're looking for ways to bless people, and I, and I had some difficulty at first, you know, I would really need to uh, seriously pray and ask Jesus to place some people in my life that I could be a blessing to or uh, provide circumstances where I could bless others. Um, and, and at first, you know, you're really trying to keep your eye open, and then it's like God just shoves you into the direction. Uh, I, this might be hard to believe, but I'm normally a shy person, and I know that sounds, <laughs> sounds weird, but I am, and that's why normally I'm late to church, because I don't like the whole shaking hands and saying good morning to everybody, because <laughs> I'm kind of shy. But um, for the most part, it's just forced me to be more outgoing to other people, whether it's eating with them or the Lord provides a way that I can do something uh, where I can bless others. And what I've learned is the blessing necessarily, isn't necessarily for other people and how much it has really changed just, just it, it changed my heart and changed me. Um, one small example is uh, I was at work and uh, we have probably, I don't know, maybe during the day shift, 75 co-workers that we, that we work with, Jason and I work with. And uh, every morning we have morning report that we have to talk about the, the ongoings of the uh, facility that we work at. And for those who don't know, we work at a 28-day inpatient rehab facility. Um, so we're sitting in report one day, and I was talking with one of our other um, referral communications ladies, and we were talking about people that we didn't really care for. Now, I know that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's probably not the most Jesus-like thing to be doing, you know what I mean? But uh, what made it interesting is, is she looked at me and she said, Megan, is there, I don't think there's anybody you don't like. And of course I'm biting my tongue, you know, because I'm not just going to announce and rattle off a list of people. But the fact is that in the last couple of weeks, it's changed my attitude uh, towards other people. Um, that it's even changing my outward attitude towards other people, that somebody that I'm kind of fairly close to at work doesn't see and doesn't see that negativity coming out of me and where I'm bad-mouthing other people. So that's, that's just one of the small ways that I've been blessed. Um, Jason and I have a very fortunate life, especially with our little girl. Um, but, you know, it's just being able to use these blessings, and it's just... I mean, it's the work of Jesus that he continues to bless us more and more and, and in the, through these small things. Now, areas that I personally struggle with are the listening. I mean, I'm sure Nana can attest to that. But it's the listening and the journaling. Now, I've been really trying to uh, cut out that chunk of time in the morning to, to make sure that I get my journaling in. And even now, um, just this past week where I've really been trying to do that the most, He's really speaking to me, and it's just been such a blessing to be part of this small group. I look forward to uh, new members coming in. Um, I'm all about having a draft pick, but I'm not sure that the pastor's for that. So <laughs> uh, we'll see, but no, I'm looking forward to us breaking out as much as I really do depend on our small group that we have right now. I'm looking forward to bringing new members in and us breaking apart and developing our own small groups. So just like Jeff had said, I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. Um, it is a, it is a life-changing book if you let it speak into your life. But that's just been my few experiences. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks, Rhonda and, and Laura. I, I appreciate you doing that for me. Um, we didn't make Jason speak because he's going to speak next week. Um, he's going to be um, our guest speaker for the week, so um, that'll give him an opportunity. Maybe he'll share a little bit about um, some things he's been doing. Um, Matt's another member of the group. And, you know, I knew that when word got out that I was the speaker for today, that there wouldn't you know, be as many people here as normal. But I really didn't expect that the drummer and guitarist would bail on me, too. <laughs> but, apparently, but apparently they did. Um, so I, I just I want to thank you for listening to me today. And I want to urge you that um, if, some, if, it's, you know, if it's Pastor Scott or if it's someone else that comes up to you and asks you to take a book, um, please consider it. Don't, don't just say no. Um, please consider it because I really think... Um, that you'll enjoy it, um, and that you know some of the things I talked about today 
um, will actually start happening in your life. Um, let's, let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you um, for this time that we have to gather together and worship you. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for our country um, as there were two um, terrible tragedies yesterday, and I just pray um, that you would step in and heal our country. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with um, Pastor Scott and Lori as, as they head home this week, early this week. I pray that you would protect them. I pray that you give them a sense of peace um, as they're maybe traveling without a spare tire. And Lord, I just pray that you give them protection and allow them to enjoy the rest of their vacation um, in spite of the setback that they had. Um, and I pray that you bring us back together again next week. In Jesus' name, amen.